I'm going to tell you today about uh, uh, our work at, in the laboratory for radio krypton dating. It's in the physics division. And uh, I will tell you about the, the tool we use, the atom trap, and the isotope uh, we, we analyze, which is krypton-81, and the applications. These are dating uh, old groundwater uh, from all over the world. The work is supported by DOE Office of Nuclear Physics and by Argon LDRD. Uh, as, uh, as Stephen uh, introduced, this work is highly uh, interdivisional, inter interdiscipline, and uh, I think LDRD support has been a very crucial part uh, the, to allow us to, to continue this line of work. And some of the field work I will show is supported by NSF Earth Science and also by uh, an array of agencies from the uh, international community. So let me start with uh, an example of isotope dating that you are all familiar with. That's radiocarbon dating. This is based on this isotope carbon-14 with a half-life of 5,730 years. It's produced in the upper atmosphere when cosmic rays uh, hit on the, the stable nitrogen-14 nucleus, turning it into carbon-14. Then it oxidizes. It, it becomes CO and CO2, and uh, since it's a gas, it stays in the atmosphere for a long time. That's a very, very important step for an isotope to be useful uh, uh, for dating. Right? because cosmic ray flux is uh, definitely uneven on the surface of the Earth. And so it, it's, it's this process, that the gas phase in the atmosphere for a long time, that allows the isotope to be mixed really well. So all over the Earth's atmosphere, we all start with the, the uniform uh, uh, isotopic abundance of carbon-14. Then plants absorb carbon and then transfer it all the way up to us through the food chain, so we all acquire the same carbon-14 over carbon ratio. Uh, when this exchange with the air stops, that's when the radiocarbon dating clock starts ticking. Okay? The, the carbon-14 abundance goes down by a factor of two uh, every 5,730 years. So by measuring the abundance of carbon-14, uh, the isotope ratio in carbon-14 in, uh, in, in the sample, you can tell the so-called radiocarbon age. That's the basic principle of radiocarbon dating. Okay? And this is actually a Chicago idea. It was uh, uh, first proposed by Willard Libby in, uh, towards the end of 1940s, and he received the Nobel Prize uh, for this work. And it's very, very successful. Uh, it's been used in a wide range of fields, including earth and environmental science. But it does have a limitation, okay? And uh, this exponential curve, I, I plotted in a sort of strange way because uh, both the vertical and horizontal axes are in, in the logarithmic uh, scale. And I do it this way so that to show you what happens when the age of, uh, of a sample is much shorter or much, much longer than the half-life, okay? So when the age of a sample is much shorter than the half-life, say a factor of 10, a factor uh, lower, uh, not much is happening. Okay, so radiocarbon dating is not sensitive there. Okay, on the other hand, when the, the age is much longer than the half-life, uh, you, you look at this slope and say, wow, it's, it's, the slope is getting steeper. That's good. It's getting very, very sensitive. But on the, on the, uh, uh, on the other hand, the, the counting rate is dropping uh, very fast. Okay, so, so the, the analyst is fighting from both ends. And it's, it's human nature. For, for, the, for the analyst to try to push the instrument to, to even lower and lower, make it more sensitive so that you can be sensitive to, uh, to uh, longer ages. And a lot of people do that, but when you do that, uh, danger lurks behind. Okay? Uh, when the uh, isotope ratio is so much below the modern level, uh, this is very sensitive to any perturbation, any contamination of the modern sample, which inevitably happens. This could happen inside the instrument itself. Uh, it could happen during the sampling, during purification process, or it could happen within the aquifer itself. Okay? So uh, say if there's a 1% contamination of modern carbon, then this uh, ratio is pinged over here, no matter how old the sample is. Okay? So these days, with radiocrypton dating, we can measure uh, 
samples that were previously thought to be 30,000, 40,000 years old by radiocarbon dating. And we often found the dates wrong. It actually is much older. And I think the reason is because of contamination. Okay? So uh, it's actually not a good idea to, to probe uh, uh, much, much deeper into this area. So this limits the uh, useful age range for radiocarbon dating, or for any radioisotopes, there is this, this finite range. Okay? So these are the, uh, some of the radioisotopes in, we found in the environment. The great ones are commonly used. For example, chlorine-36 and beryllium-10 can be easily analyzed, so, so was carbon-14, can be e easily analyzed using the accelerator mass spectrometry technique, AMS technique. Okay? But the problem with these two isotopes is uh, that, that they are not gas isotopes. Okay? They, are, they, are, uh, they are produced in the atmosphere, and then they quickly attach to aerosols, and then they come down with the rain. Uh, for example, this is the uh, beryllium-10 deposition flux over the surface of the Earth, and they vary a lot. Okay? Uh, certainly, the cosmic ray flux is uneven. They are concentrated near the two poles. And then the, the deposition of beryllium-10 on the surface of Earth also is affected uh, by the climate, by the weather. Okay? So using uh, climate models, one can simulate what the deposition flux is. I think the hope is that we can figure out uh, the deposition pattern and then use that pattern to tell uh, what the initial value of beryllium-10 is on the surface of the Earth. And what they found in this paper is that the, uh, the flux, initial flux varies by as much as factor of 10. So it goes from 500 in this region to 50 over here. So that makes uh, the interpretation of dates very, very difficult. You can measure the beryllium-10 isotope ratio, but what's the date? You have to know what the initial value is. And so initial, if the initial value varies by a factor of 10, then the dating becomes very difficult. Okay? So it's for this reason that we want the isotope to stay in the atmosphere as a chemical, uh, chemically stable gas. And so satisfy these uh, requirements are these four isotopes, carbon, and three noble gas uh, radioisotopes, krypton-85, argon-39, and krypton-81. It's very fortunate that these four isotopes have different half-lives. They, they fall in different orders of magnitude. So uh, the four of them together form a continuous chain covering from a few years to a million years. Okay? The analysis of carbon-14 has been solved by the AMS technique. What we are trying to do is solve the analysis of these three isotopes. Okay? So I will first tell you about krypton-81 and krypton-85. Then later in the talk, I will talk about argon-39. Krypton-81 uh, is also produced in the upper atmosphere, uh, atmosphere by cosmic rays when it hits on the heavy isotopes like uh, krypton-82, that's stable. And then uh, it can produce krypton-81. Or a neutron capture of krypton-80 can produce uh, krypton-81. And because it's a noble gas, it stays in the air basically for hundreds of thousands of years. So it's a very uniform redistribution in, in, in the atmosphere. Okay? Its half-life is 229,000 years. It's about 40 times longer than carbon-14. So it can cover a uh, uh, region all the way back to a million years. It can be used to date groundwater, I talked about, but also polar ice. See, ice has been accumulating in Greenland in Antarctica for hundreds of thousands of years, maybe a million years, maybe over a million years. Okay? Uh, when the ice formed, it trapped ancient air, ancient dust particles, and nowadays these ice samples can be poured up and analyzed in the laboratory. Okay? Uh, what we want to pro uh, provide is an isotope dating uh, tool so that the glaciologists can know when the ice formed. Okay? To do so, one has to overcome two technical challenges. Uh, first, the isotope ratio of krypton-81 is very low. It's 6 times 10 to the minus 13 in the atmosphere. For the old samples, it's 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15. Okay? And two, uh, there are not that many krypton-81 atoms in the, the, in the sample. If we take a liter of air right here, you expect to find about 20,000 krypton-81 atoms. In a liter of water or ice, about 1,000. So whatever counting method you come up with, has to be able to do it very efficiently. 
So that's Krypton-81. Uh, the other isotope, Krypton-85, has a, a much shorter half-life, only 11 years. So you would think there are not many Krypton-85 atoms in the atmosphere because it doesn't have that long half-life to accumulate, right? But uh, when people measured the isotope abundance, they found it's actually more than Krypton-81. It's 10 to minus 11. So what's going on? The reason is that Krypton-85 is a fission isotope. It's produced when uh, uranium and thorium nuclear split up. Okay? So let me explain how this works. Uh, this is the chart of isotopes. So the vertical axis is the number of protons, the horizontal axis number of neutrons. Okay? These uh, grayish squares, these are the stable isotopes, and they, they run along this diagonal line. So this is the so-called valley of stability. Okay? Nuclear fission tend to produce neutron-rich isotopes. So they, they tend to produce uh, stuff here, which are all short-lived. So they quickly beta decay along diagonally along this uh, equal mass chain. And in the case of mass 80, uh, they all stop, they pile up over here, producing krypton-85. So that's how krypton-85 is produced, uh, by nuclear, uh, human activity induced nuclear fission and then released by nuclear fuel reprocessing plants uh, uh, in, in, in Europe, in Russia, and, and in America. Now, we can also look at the mass 81 chain. Here, the, the beta decay stops right here uh, by, uh, at the stable bromine 81 nucleus. So, bromine 81 shields krypton 81 from all these uh, nuclear fission products. It's a miracle. Uh, without this, krypton 81 dating wouldn't work. Okay? So, uh, nuclear fission produce, produces lots of krypton 85, but negligible amount of krypton 81 for this reason. Uh, so, in fact, krypton-85 in the atmosphere used to be very, very low, but uh, starting from uh, at the dawn of the nuclear age, it has been climbing uh, rapidly. Okay? I think right now the level is about a factor million more than in 1940s. <clears throat> this is a, a figure I found in Scientific American article, an old Scientific American article, uh, and the vertical axis is krypton-85 in the atmosphere. The unit is mega Curie, okay? So since the 50s, it's been going up. And this used to be classified information, actually, because uh, the amount of krypton-85 is proportional to the amount of uh, plutonium that people have recovered during nuclear uh, fuel reprocessing. So what you do is you take the sealed rod, you break them up, uh, dissolve in the chemicals so they can extract plutonium, right? But in that process, krypton-85 being a noble gas escapes into the air, okay? So knowing how much our side has produced, how much plutonium we have produced, you can actually figure out uh, what, what's the other side doing. Yeah. So uh, nowadays, the krypton-85 decay activity is three times 10 to the fourth decays per minute per liter of krypton. So that's, that's 85 uh, decay activity. In, uh, uh, Compared to that, the decay activity of krypton-81 is five orders magnitude uh, lower. This is simply because krypton-81 is so long-lived, so it decays very slowly, okay? And uh, so detection of krypton-81 by decay counting has always been difficult. It was first done by Hans Erschke and Ugo Lusli at the University of Bern back in 1969, okay? Krypton-81 decays by electron capture, uh, following that, there is a characteristic X-ray by the daughter nucleus. It's a 13 keV. So that's what they found, okay? So with this, they discovered for the first time the presence of this isotope uh, in the atmosphere. The isotope itself was discovered much earlier. It actually, was done by, at Argonne National Laboratory, okay? But the, the presence of this isotope in the atmosphere was discovered by Erschke and Lusley back in 69, okay? Uh, so... Uh, this method is not practical for environmental applications because uh, the decay rate is very slow. Uh, in 100 hours, only 3 times 10 to the minus 8 actually decay. So efficiency is very low. So for this work, they used 2 liters of pure krypton. Krypton is about 1 ppm in the atmosphere. So 2 liter means 2 million liters of air. It's a huge sample. But uh, the point, for this, this is a discovery experiment. 
Okay? And uh, uh, what's remarkable about, about uh, Ershke and Loosley is that at the time, they had no idea how to count Krypton-81s in a reasonable sample. But they were not deterred by this uh, practical uh, barrier, right? They say, well, somehow, someday, if someone figure out how to count Krypton-81 in a reasonable sample, then boy, this, this would be a very, very useful isotope for, for geological dating. Okay? Uh, today, uh, 40, 46 years later, we are on the verge of, uh, of realizing this vision. So, so let me explain how, how we count Krypton-81. Uh, the, the base of this work is that uh, uh, different isotopes, atoms of different isotopes, have different resonant frequencies. This is called uh, isotope shifts because, because they have different nuclear moments, different nuclear volume, and, and uh, uh, mass. Okay? So for this particular transition, it's at 811 nanometer. It's near infrared. This is a transition we use to trap krypton atoms. Okay? And here I listed the resonant frequencies of different isotopes. Krypton has six stable isotopes. They're in blue. And the, these are the two long-lived uh, isotopes. The even isotopes and odd isotopes are separated because of the hyperfine structure, because even isotopes have no nuclear moments. Okay? So let's just look at the, this group of odd isotopes. Okay? The separation is about uh, 100 megahertz. And the line, natural line width is about 6 megahertz. So the idea is to scan the laser frequency across. When we hit the resonance of this atom, the atom will glow. will we'll scatter photons so you see a bright dot. Okay? The transition rate is actually quite high, 10 million times per second. That's the allowed transition rate, uh, transition rate of an allowed E1 transition. Okay? And then if you want to see Krypton-83, you tune the laser frequency over here. You see the fluorescence. So that, that's the idea. Okay? But in a real sample, remember, the, the abundance of these atoms are very different. Uh, in fact, the, the middle one is uh, 11 orders of magnitude higher than this one, and 10 orders of magnitude higher than this one. So the actual signal, the fluorescence you see, is this transition rate of individual atoms multiplied by the isotope uh, abundance. So this is the actual signal you would see. And the, this, tail of the Lorentzian uh, peak basically completely buries these two tiny uh, isotopes on the side. So that's the difficulty. That's why regular laser spectroscopy techniques don't work uh, for, for these rare isotope analysis. Okay? So, so how do you go about to solve this problem? Well, uh, this is only, uh, if we can take an atom and scatter uh, photons, uh, not just once, but twice in a row, what would be the signal? In that case, you would plot rate squared times isotopic abundance, and you see that the peak gets a little bit narrower. You just do it twice. Okay, so this is a one photon scattering, this is a two photon scattering, uh, five, ten photon scattering. So this is a rate to the tenth power. Okay? And simply by repeating the scattering of photons, and uh, you can narrow down the peaks. So that's how we resolve these three peaks. Okay? We actually all know uh, how, why this works. When you're not sure about something, what do you do? Well, you ask somebody, right? You see, if we can check my number, see if I got it right. If, if we both of us agree, then we probably got it right, okay? And so this is because independent checks reduce the, the probability of being wrong uh, exponentially. Not linearly, but exponentially, okay? So simply by repeating the scattering of photons 10 times, you can already resolve uh, peaks that's 10 orders magnitude different. Okay, so that, that's basically uh, how we do it. There is an atomic device that naturally implements this strategy, and that's the, uh, the magneto-optical trap of atoms. Okay? This was developed in the 80s in the field of atomic physics and was actually awarded the Nobel Physics Prize in 1997. And this picture was taken in one of the Nobel laureates' uh, laboratory, Bill Phillips' laboratory, and NIST, uh, trapped here are uh, sodium atoms. Sodium atoms are nice visually because they, they are orange. They glow orange. So you can actually see directly with, with your own eyes. I started my atom trapping uh, uh, work here at Argonne when I was a graduate student, actually with, with Linda, with Linda Young. Um, and we used to trap sodium atoms. So I remember we could actually look in the, the windows, see a bright dot in the middle of the, of, of the vacuum chamber. Okay? 
And uh, the atoms uh, are held inside a vacuum by laser beams. The force on the atoms come, come from uh, scattering of photons. So for krypton, for example, uh, each photon kick changes the velocity of the atom by 6 millimeters per second. It's not much. But remember, the transition rate is 10 to the 7th per second. So you multiply the two, you get a decent acceleration, Okay, 6 times 10 to the 4th. That's you know, 6,000 times gravity. And for these neutral, these are neutral atoms, not ions. For neutral atoms, the second force experience is indeed gravity. Okay? So, uh, but, but for this force to be significant, the frequency of the laser has to be in, on resonance with this atomic transition. If the frequency goes off, then the force goes down, the trap doesn't work. So, so this magneto optical trap uh, naturally incorporates these two characteristics, resonance and repetition, which we need to do isotope, uh, uh, rare isotope detection. Okay? So here's a schematic of our setup. Um, trapping krypton is a bit more complicated than trapping sodium. With sodium atoms, uh, there's this outer unpaired electron you can actually directly excite with, with lasers. Krypton and all noble gas atoms, they have a very tightly bound uh, shell, right? So it's hard to uh, excite the atom from the ground level up. It would take a VUV photon uh, at uh, around the 120 nanometer to do that. We don't have uh, high power, narrow line with laser at this wavelength, okay? So, this is, so we, we, what we do is we run the gas through a discharge, basically relying on the electron atom collision to populate the atoms into a metastable state. And basically, if you take an electron to the next higher level, leaving a hole behind, and the, both the hole and the electron has a spin one half. So if you uh, line up the spin so that they form a triplet uh, uh, spin state, then it's very hard for, for, for the electron to decay back, because the electron would have to uh, decay and flip spin at the same time. It's, it's an M2 transition, so that's very, late, very, very uh, slow. So that's why the atom in this metastable state has a long radiative lifetime of 40 seconds. That's long enough for us to trap the atoms. So once the atom is in the metastable state, then uh, it's, it's easy to excite this krypton atom to a, a higher level. A, krypton, a metastable krypton atom looks like a rubidium atom. So we use the 811 nanometer infrared light to slow the atoms down to trap them, okay? So that's why when the gas come out, it goes through a, like a coil. We excite a discharge inside the tube, okay? A small fraction of the atoms goes into the metastable states, and then we start apply lasers from sideways to collimate the atomic beam so that more of them can, uh, can, can reach the, the trap region, okay? And here we have a la laser beam counter-propagate the atoms uh, to slow the atoms down, okay? What's the stopping distance of, of an atom uh, from a thermal, a thermal atom uh, using this laser light? That's a very interesting calculation. Actually, I, I like to do this uh, just for fun. Because in this calculation, uh, you need to know the momentum of the, of the uh, photon, so you need Planck's constant, 10 to minus 34, right? You need the speed of light, uh, 10 to the eighth. Uh, you need to know the speed of the atom, so you need the uh, a Boltzmann's constant, 10 to the minus 23. You need to know the mass of the atom, so it's, it's 10 to the minus 27 kilo, kilograms, right? All these huge numbers uh, going up and down, but the final answer is one. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it takes about a meter to stop a thermal atom using, using laser light, okay? And uh, it could easily be 100, then we would not have this experiment. Uh, so, so once the atom is slow enough, it enters these, uh, the region where six laser beams cross, and the atoms, they're trapped. An atom in the, in the center continues to scatter photons from all six laser beams, so it appears as a bright dot, which we can image using a CCD camera. Okay? So, so that works. We can actually, uh, it's very selective. We can, pick, uh, choose, uh, we can tune the frequency to krypton-81, and this trap only traps krypton-81. So when this work, uh, uh, when we saw this signal, uh, I knew we have uh, uh, made a new method work. So I said, well, we should have a name for it. 
the, the low-level counting LLC. There was this uh, accelerator mass spectrometry AMS. What should we call uh, our method, right? I remember I was driving on 75th Street and uh, thinking about it, and then I came up with this uh, name, uh, Rare Atom Trap Spectrometry, R-A-T-S. Well, it's a nifty uh, acronym, right? Uh, when I proposed it, nobody liked it for some reason. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, Linda uh, proposed the Atom Trap Trace Analysis, ADA, and we all like it. So, so that's, a, that's, that's the name for the method. Uh, so this is uh, the, the trap set up in our laboratory. This is in building 203, and I should say that you're all welcome to go visit. If you're interested, we'll be happy to give you a tour. Okay? And here's the source end, here's the trap site, and the, the fluorescence of the atom in the chamber can be imaged on this, uh, this, this camera. Okay? The, we have gone through several generations of the instrument. This is the latest generation, and this is the latest uh, team operating and developing the, this apparatus. Uh, this is Jake Zapala, a PhD student from University of Chicago, and Wei Jiang, a, a assistant physicist uh, in the div physics division. Uh, so, so once you have the image of single atom, you, you circle this area, you count uh, the number of photon counts, and uh, you monitor this area over time. When there's no atoms, there's a little bit of scattering light. You see scattering light, uh, there's ripples. But when one atom comes in, it go, it's, it, the signal is very clear. Sometimes we can accidentally trap two or even three atoms. Okay? So that's how we count individual atoms. Uh, how do we know that when a bright dot appears, that's a krypton-81 or krypton-83, uh, we know by where we park the laser frequency, because they show up at different laser frequency settings. Okay? So if we scan the laser frequencies uh, fast across, you see six gigantic peaks. These are the stable isotopes. So on camera, you basically see a flashing balls, you know, balls flashing and go through. These are the six isotopes, uh, stable isotopes, okay? And this is where we would expect krypton-81. This is where we would expect krypton-85. And you indeed see uh, these two peaks. Now for this, you have to wait a lot longer. You have to basically park the laser frequency here, uh, wait, count these atoms, and then move step by step. To, to finish a scan. Notice the atom counts are zero on both sides of the peak. That's very important, okay? Because nearby, there is a peak that's 11 orders magnitude higher. So we, we show that there is actually no interference at all from this nearby uh, isotope. In fact, there's no interference from any other molecules, any other elements, okay? And this is remarkable. I think it's a unique property among all trace analysis methods. And it works because we detect the atom in a fundamentally different way. Instead of one big bang on a, on a uh, detector, we actually detect a trickle of a million photons in coincidence. And it's that redundancy built into the detection system that guarantee that we never, never make, an, uh, make a mistake. Okay? So, so how low of abundance can we see? Well, we have seen 10 to the minus 16, and uh, uh, we can continue to push the, the, the detect sensitivity and uh, uh, detect even rare isotopes. In the end, uh, when we don't detect a, a rare isotope, it's never because it's buried by some background. We don't have a background, okay? It's because we simply don't have enough time to accumulate a one single count. So it's always statistically limited with this method. So let me show you the quantitative measurement of isotope ratios. Uh, we measure the isotope abundance uh, by this basic principle is that if the isotope is more abundant, it'll show up in the trap more frequently, okay? But lots of things can affect how frequently we can capture atoms, right? Laser power changes, alignment drifts, discharge can be brighter and dimmer. So all these things can affect the capture rate of krypton atoms. So what we always do is we measure uh, a rare isotope and compare it with a stable isotope. And we, we not, not simultaneously, we switch back and forth in minutes, okay? And uh, uh, what's important, in this work, we actually deliberately misalign the, la the laser beams and trying to uh, make the loading rate for this rare isotope up and down uh, or let it go 
more, change more than order of magnitude, okay? But the important thing is that the ratio between the two uh, line up on a straight line. So we can, that, that's how we measure the isotope ratios uh, of Krypton-85 over a stable isotope, Krypton-83. This is actually uh, not trivial, again, because this ratio is 11 orders magnitude, okay? We went through several methods, and, uh, but, but I like this method the best. This method was only developed about two years ago, and uh, it's, it's simple, and it has worked very reliably. And we call it the, the, the ion collection method, okay? Uh, let me explain this. So uh, you can measure the brightness of, of this uh, ball. So this is no longer counting individual atoms. We, we use individual atom counting for the rare isotope, but for the stable isotope, you have basically a ball, a bright ball of uh, millions of atoms, all right? So how do you measure the loading rate of this stable isotope? That's a challenge. Uh, we can measure the brightness uh, of, of this uh, uh, ball, and that's proportional to number of atoms in the trap, okay? But that's not what we want. What we want is a loading rate, L, okay? How do we get that? Well, the, the dynamics follows this uh, simple differential equations, right? It says it's the change of atoms in, in the trap equals to the loading rate minus the loss rate. Atoms are lost when uh, you have a background gas hit on the, the cold atoms and knock it out of the trap, okay? So that this gamma is, uh, is affected by the background uh, ga gas pressure. So if you just turn off, the, if you block the atom trap, and then let it go, you can see exponential rise. From that, you can fit for gamma, and finally you can get L. That's how people used to do it. That's how we used to do it, okay? But there's a complication, that when you have so many atoms in the trap, now the, the cold atoms, the atoms in the trap, start to collide with each other. That causes a loss as well. Now, this is much more complicated because now it depends on the overlap, the spatial distribution, how densely the atoms are packed in the trap. And now you have this additional constant beta, and then you have the spatial distribution of atoms. That made it very difficult. And people try to fit, and we try to fit. We can do a, maybe a 20% measurement this way. But we need a much better way to do that, a much more accurate way to, to measure this L. Okay? So two, two considerations helped. First, that we realize that our beta term, this last term, dominates, okay? Uh, this is only possible because uh, we have such an efficient trap nowadays. Uh, I think we have the highest loading rate of all the atom traps in the world. We have 10 to the 12th per second, okay? So with this very high loading rate, uh, the, the, the atoms are so densely packed that this beta loss term dominates. It's, uh, it's almost two orders of magnitude higher than, than the first background loss term, okay? So, so at equilibrium, we can neglect this term. L, the loading rate that we want, equals to this, okay? Now let's look at this uh, cold collision between trapped atoms. There are actually two ways the atoms can get lost. Uh, these are the two metastable krypton atoms. When they get, get together, they can either go through penning ionization. One atom uh, drops to ground level. The other atom is ionized. That's one lost channel. Okay, so both the ground and ions basically escape the trap. There's another large channel that the two can form a, a molecule, an ion molecules. Neutral krypton atoms don't form a dimer, but an ion can form a dimer, okay? So that's another large channel. It's very fortunate that both channels give us a single positive charge. If they have two, if, if this is a one positive charge, this is a two positive charge, this whole method wouldn't work. Then we'll have to decide what the branching ratio is, and that gets very complicated. But because they both produce one positive charge, we don't need to know the branching ratio. We can just measure the total charge, okay? So, so that's why we have this Faraday cup. We direct the ions into the Faraday cup. The ion, uh, the current, is, uh, is, a fa is basically half of the loading rate of the neutral atoms in the trap, no matter what the beta is, no matter what the spatial distribution is, okay? So that, that's how this, uh, this, this method works. And it has worked very reliably. We can do loading rate measurement below 1%. So uh, before we can convince a wider community, we have to pass a test. And so we collaborated with uh, Roland Perchett at the University of Bern. 
Roland follows this long tradition of Eschke, Lusle, this line where they are experts of uh, radio noble gas uh, isotope decay counting. Okay? And uh, this is a Roland test. So it's, uh, Roland doesn't need to have an atom trap in order to check the correctness of our atom trap uh, results. Okay? What he does is he can take a sample with high uh, krypton-85 isotope ratio, and he can take an, uh, a sample with very low krypton-85 isotope ratio. Then he can just do volume mixing. He knows which, how much volume he puts in uh, sample one, how much volume he puts in sample two. He can produce a range of samples simulating sample of different uh, ages. Okay? Then he sent it to us, we analyzed, and we passed the Roland test. So uh, another characteristic I want to tell you uh, that's very important for any application is the sample size. Okay? And uh, more, the more efficient we can build the atom trap, the less sample we would need from the field. Okay? So when I talk to geologists, they always want to know, how much sample do I need to, to collect? How much water, how much ice do I need to collect? And so this is something we've been working on for a very long time. And, uh, uh, so this is a ruler that measures our progress. As the efficiency goes up, the amount of sample goes down, needed, okay? So 1969, when Lusli and Erschke did the low-level counting, uh, the, the efficiency was, was very low, and uh, there was a one accelerator mass spectrometry effort, uh, uh, also was done here, and this is the, the efficiency uh, that got us started, uh, 10 to minus seven, but today we have improved the efficiency to here, 10 to minus three which means we need about 100 liters of water or about 50 kilograms of ice to do analysis, okay? That's very comfortable for groundwater dating, and we are just touching the usefulness uh, uh, in, in the polar ice, so we can start to polar ice uh, dating uh, at this point. Uh, certainly, we want to continue to improve the method. Uh, our next goal is to reduce uh, the sample size, improve the efficiency, and reduce the sample size by another factor of five. I think we'll get there sometime this or next year. And there is this uh, Im imaginary line that uh, 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 once we cross, we will affect how geologists sample uh, water and ice. So right now, we need about 100 kilograms of water or ice. That's too much to ship from field to the lab, okay? So what they usually do is degassing in the field. I'll show you how they do that. But they, they, they tell me that uh, if we can get to here, then they will just scoop up the water and ice and pack it and go bring it home. So that will make it much easier. Uh, a, a, a typical field geologist with no special training would be able to do the sampling. So I think that's important. But for now, we need specialists to, to sample in the field. And uh, there are a handful of groups around the world who can do that. But let me tell you the, uh, my close collaborator, Reika Yokochi of the University of Chicago. Uh, this is a, uh, her machine, her, her sampling machine. The, the center part is a membrane, and it's a hydrophobic membrane. So water cannot go across the membrane, but gas can, okay? So you basically uh, get to a place, this, this thing sits inside a van, we back the van next to the, to the well and hook up the water. When the water flows across, um, flows along the membrane, and then we pump on the other side and collect the gas into a gas cylinder. That's how it's done in the field, okay? And we can collect the sample in less than an hour nowadays, so it's, it's actually quite easy. So this is uh, uh, one example, so here, here we were uh, at the Negev Desert in Israel last year, and this is a modern well. It goes down about 1,000 meters deep, okay? And uh, in this particular place, the water uh, is used for, for a mining company, okay? So, so here we're sampling the water. Uh, this is the outback of Australia. Underneath uh, this uh, pebble land is the Great Artesian Basin. Uh, perhaps the largest aquifer in the world. So the, there's a well there. The water here is used for agriculture and for the, to, for the livestock. This place, uh, this is uh, Antarctica, Taylor Glacier of Antarctica. I didn't go to this place. A geologist, glaciologist went there. 
And uh, sampling ice is a little bit more involved because uh, gas just doesn't come out of ice by themselves. So, so they brought a gigantic uh, vacuum chamber okay, uh, into the field. They, they pull up the ice, they stuff it in, cover up the chamber, then they pump, first pump away all the air, then they light up a fire underneath the vacuum chamber to, to melt the ice. Okay? And when the ice melts, krypton gas come out, they pump the second time. The second time, they compress the gas into a cylinder. So that's the sample we get. Okay? So the sample comes to the lab, actually goes to Reka's lab, and Reka has this, uh, this flow machine that can extract krypton. Okay? And she's now getting so good at it, she can process a sample in 16 minutes. This is actually a title of her recent talk. I love this title, Pure Krypton in 16 Minutes. Okay? And the technique she used, she used uh, adsorptive enrichment, basically uh, cool down the, the gas, and then when it warms up, different elements like oxygen, nitrogen, and krypton, they come out at different temperatures. So that's the first step. Okay? Then she used the gas chromatography, just let the gas run through a long tube, and argon and krypton would emerge at different times. Okay? And finally, she uses a titanium pump to, to clean up uh, the gas. So when it finally comes to our lab, are these tubes with a Nupro valve. Okay? Out of uh, 100 kilograms of water, we get about 5 microliters of krypton. Okay? Uh, nowadays, there's a growing number of labs that can do the sampling and sample preparation. And uh, I think that this list will continue, this list will continue to, to grow. Uh, what we are seeing is the beginning of a worldwide effort uh, to, do, to map the aquifer using Krypton-81. So let me give you a few uh, examples of applications. This is the, uh, the uh, Great Artesian Basin in Australia. Here's a map of Australia. And you see this is actually a, a sizable fraction of the Australian map. So it's a, it's a huge aquifer. And uh, uh, geologists have already uh, measured the water table level. Okay, so they, they know the, the water depth. And the, from the altitude, they can uh, draw some flow lines. So here are the, the, the blue line arrows are basically lines that are perpendicular to the equal potential uh, uh, lines. Okay? Um, but they know that's not how the water goes. Water on the surface goes according to the, the steepest, along the steepest descent, right? But water underground is largely affected by the resistivity of, of the aquifer itself. So different rock formation will have uh, different resistivity. They can vary by many orders of magnitude, okay? So, so this map is not accurate. That's why they need to do this uh, isotope dating. By providing the, the historical flow dates, we can use it these, uh, these age information to calibrate their hydrodynamic models. And once they have the model, the hope is that they can then guide a more scientific uh, use, more sustainable use of this uh, precious resource. That's the whole purpose. That's why we want to go uh, date the water. And so for this work, we had uh, 20 samples dated along one flow line. And uh, so that's the initial work. As you see, in order to map the entire aquifer, we would probably have to date thousands of samples. So that's the future work for us to do. And this work is uh, led by Andy Love of uh, Flinders University in Australia and Roland Perchard of the University of Bern. So that's one example. Another example on the Culebra Dolomite aquifer. It's a small aquifer, but it's an aquifer of a, of a particular interest. This aquifer happens to lie uh, above the waste isolation pilot plant uh, locations. This is where the U.S. deposits some of the nuclear waste. And uh, obviously, uh, you would like to see the water to be old, isolated, so that it has a less risk of carrying the, whatever the uh, waste uh, to, to the uh, surrounding environment. Okay? So this work was led by Neil Sturchill and also Chris Coleman of uh, Sandia National Laboratory. Here we only sampled two wells, one here, one here. These red lines are the uh, model flow lines uh, by, by Chris Coleman, and he uses our Krypton-81 age to calibrate his high, uh, flow model. Okay? 
So we found one to be 330,000 years old. This is 130,000 years old. So that's good news for, for WIP, actually, that the water is indeed old, uh, as expected. Okay? And this year, they will go, the Neil and the Chris will go back to sample more wells. And Neil is also talking to the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. They want to uh, promote this method so that eventually Krypton-81 will be used to characterize uh, all the nuclear waste uh, repository sites uh, in the world. Uh, at IAEA, there is a water resources uh, department. This is the department chair, uh, Pradeep Agawa. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so he studied, he led this study in the, in the Guarani aquifer in, the <coughs> in South America. This, this is in Brazil. In addition to mapping out the hydrological models, uh, he's also very interested in the helium-4 concentration in the aquifer, okay? Helium-4 is a very interesting story. It's produced in the alpha decay uh, by, by, uh, uh, by uranium and thorium alpha decay, and it comes out into the atmosphere. Then over a course of a million years, it slowly goes up in the atmosphere, into the upper atmosphere, and gets lost because it's very light. It's not bound gravity field, okay? And uh, there has been a long debate in, ge in the field of earth science that how the uh, helium gas uh, emerge from the deep underground to the surface. Okay. One of the candidates is groundwater. So uh, Pradeep wants to see whether we can provide some data to, to shed some light on this debate. Okay. So at various wells in the uh, Guarani aquifer, uh, they, uh, we measure the Krypton-81 and we compare that with the amount of helium-4 in the water sample, okay? So let's look at this, this uh, data plot. Uh, first, these uh, yellow data points are carbon-14 age from radiocarbon dating, and you see that it tops off at, at about 30,000 years. It cannot go above that, okay? That reaches the limit of radiocarbon dating. The blue ones are the krypton-81 ages that we, we provided. Now, uh, for the helium-4 ages, there are three curves. The green ones are helium-4 ages if you assume that all the helium is, ge is generated in situ. Basically, whatever the uranium thorium content in the aquifer is, goes into the water, okay? If that's assumption, then it would take 10 million years for, to get, get that kind of helium-4 gas that, we, that uh, uh, the lab measures. So that's too high. And so there needs to be another source of helium going into the aquifer. <clears throat> and so you need uh, basically helium gas to come from uh, deeper underground, from the crustal flux of helium-4. If you introduce that much helium-4, if you assume all of the helium-4 gets into the aquifer, then the age is, is too young. It only takes 10,000 years to accumulate that much helium-4, okay? So by fitting the helium data with, in order for them to agree, uh, it seems to indicate that about a couple percent of the crustal flux of helium-4 gets into the aquifer. So that's what we learned from this study. Okay? And uh, so next time when you have a birthday party, trying to bring up this topic into the conversation. It's the groundwater that carries the helium uh, into the, uh, this party balloon. So over the past three years, we have done 17 collabor collaborative projects we have analyzed about 150 samples, and samples extracted from all seven continents. I'm very proud of this. We didn't try to do this. It just happened this way. And all of them, except one, are groundwater uh, samples. So let me tell you a little bit about this one sample in Antarctica. <clears throat> this work was led by uh, Christopher Bozert. He was a graduate student, attended one of my talks, and uh, uh, it, it just so happened that they have the right the cooking pot, the, the vacuum chamber that can be heated up uh, in the field. 
So he went, went to the field, convinced the collaboration that they should, should sample Krypton for us. So I'm very so, uh, impressed by, by his leadership as a graduate student. And this is a Taylor Glacier. So let me explain why they, they're interested in this. Uh, so this is a cross-section of the Antarctica Dome. Okay? The regular way of studying the, the old ice is you go to the middle of this dome where you drill a very deep hole, 1,000 meters or 2,000 meters. Okay? And in the center of the dome, the age of the ice is preserved. So the, the deeper it is, the older it is. Okay? And then they have models that mod, the, the, the determine the age, uh, uh, the, the, the relate the, the age with the depth. Okay? Uh, so, so they believe that the deepest ice is about 800,000 years. We want to check that with Krypton 881, but right now we cannot because we need 40 kilograms of ice and nobody is able to give us, is willing to give us 40 kilograms of this very, very deep ice. Okay, so we cannot do this yet. Meanwhile, uh, they know that the old ice actually slowly moves out, okay, and then reemerge on the, on the uh, edge of the dome. Okay, they call this ice margin. Okay, this ice now is very close to the surface. Remember, you saw this uh, the, the 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 rig they, they took to the field to pull up the ice. It's not that big. It's human size. Okay, it's because they didn't have to go that deep. They can only just go down 10 meters to pull up the ice. Okay, so that's where they went to get get the ice. And uh, so with this first work, first uh, successful demonstration of Krypton 81 dating of old ice. Uh, they, they, uh, now they want to do, uh, go to many more places and uh, to find these ice margin sites. Okay? And the hope is to find ice that's even older than the deepest ice in the ice core. So that will then uh, extend the, our knowledge of the Earth climate history. So that's one area of work. So finally, let me tell you about uh, this Argon-39 isotope. Okay? Its half-life is... Uh, 268 years, so it's just the right time to study ocean circulation. Ocean water goes around the world with a cycle time of around 2,000 years. This has been mapped with carbon-14. But carbon-14, remember, it's half-life 6,000 years, so it's a bit too long. What they want, oceanographers want, is have a shorter-lived isotope, just around this, this uh, number, to, to complement the radiocarbon dating. Okay, so argon-39 is the ideal isotope that they've been waiting for for decades. Okay? The challenge is its isotopic abundance. It's at 10 to minus 16. Remember Krypton-81, the problem that we solved was at 10 to minus 12. This one is now 1,000 times uh, more difficult. Okay, so that's, that's the problem with uh, argon-39. The number of atoms in a given uh, like 20 liter ocean sample is not that low. Okay, so what's going on? How come the isotopic abundance is 1,000 times below krypton, but number of argon-39 atoms is not lower? It's actually even higher. Okay? The reason is there is so much more argon than krypton in the atmosphere. It's about four, four orders of magnitude more. Okay, among all the noble gases, uh, helium, I said, is produced uh, by alpha decays. Argon-40 also is not uh, primordial. It's produced by the decay of potassium-40. So the solid Earth is continually generating argon, degassing into, into the atmosphere. So the argon-40 in the atmosphere is actually slowly rising over billions of years. There is another dating method that people want to use to date old ice. It's to just to measure the amount of argon-40 uh, uh, in, in the ice sample. Okay? And so, so, so it's because of this tremendous amount of argon-40 that makes this argon-39 dating difficult. So we have to throw away all these argon-40 to find this argon-39 atom. So we tried to do that uh, several years ago. We temporarily converted this krypton machine into an argon machine and tried to uh, count argon-39. And indeed, we saw it. So we saw a peak. But the counting rate is really low, so we cannot do what we did for Krypton-81, just to scan a nice peak. So, so the dashed line is a Krypton-81 peak that I use here as a template. So how many data points do I need? The minimum number of data points do I need to convince you there's a peak here? Three data points, right? Uh, one below, one above, 
uh, one on top of the peak. And that's indeed what we saw. Uh, of course, uh, we, we, over the course of two weeks, we scanned back and forth, we jumped back, back and forth uh, repeatedly. We never seen an atom over here or here. So we saw 12 atoms, total atoms, over 60, 57 hours. Okay? So with this, we claim that the, there's no contamination even at 1 times 10 to the minus 16th level. Okay? So that's what we did. Uh, but lately, uh, in 2014, a, a group in Heidelberg University, they built uh, they, a dedicated system for argon-39. So instead of, you know, in our case, we converted krypton to argon, so probably a lot of things are not optimized. They designed and built an argon, uh, argon system, and they were able to uh, get a much higher counting rate for argon-39, 3.6 per hour. This is now very close to a system that can be used for practical purposes. Okay? So they have already dated uh, water, and they have planned to date glacial ice and also ocean water. So all these applications, I told you, uh, I didn't come up with any of this. This all were told uh, by, by the experts in different branches of geology. Uh, back in 2012, when we had the, the, the trap up and going, we know we have to bring in the experts so that we can uh, spread the word. So we organized a workshop. I was going to thank uh, Stephen Streifer, because he's the one who provided support uh, for us to uh, uh, organize this workshop. And we brought experts of groundwater, uh, ocean water, and also uh, glacial ice. So they all came. And uh, out of this discussion, we wrote a white paper on the applications uh, of this uh, new, new geological, uh, geochemical tools. Basically, we want to do three things. We want to map the aquifers of the world. We want to map ocean currents around the globe. And we want to date glacial ice over the Antarctica continent. And so that, that's what we will be doing in the next decade or two. And uh, I, I think you all understand I didn't do any of this alone. I've shown you the picture of Wei Jiang and Jake Zapala, but uh, uh, also in the uh, ADA group is uh, Peter Mueller, uh, Tom O'Connor, and Kevin Bailey. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Ah, this one works. Okay. <laughs> Questions for Lou? Yeah. That was really interesting. In the plots you showed of different elements for radioisotope dating, uh, radio dating, each one had a useful range that looked to be about two orders of magnitude long. I would have expected the longer-lived ones would be useful over a longer range. Why is that not so? Oh, oh, because it's a log plot. Yeah. So yes, on a linear plot, uh, that's, this will definitely happen. But uh, on a log plot, uh, it looks like a constant. Right? So, so this is a very rough guide. So we basically plotted uh, from uh, 10 times below to 10 times above, 10 times, so one-tenth of half-life to 10 times half-life. On the log plot, they look like an equal uh, line. Yeah. Lou. Have, have you ever had any opportunity to try injecting isotopes? Because one of the things important in hydrology, where is water flow in underground systems? Uh, we've never tried. Oh, I have, so first of all, I don't come up with the applications, but uh, I've heard people mentioning this. So Krypton-85 is a gas that can be uh, collected from a reactor products, and then you can actually inject this into one place and see how it permeates across an oil field, for example. Um, but we've never done that. You know, Lou, Lou, because you have this um, picture up here, can you go to the one with the beryllium 10? 
and you show the um, non-uniform distribution around the, the globe. Now, is the beryllium-10 also a cosmic ray-induced? Um, yeah, yeah. So how, so how come it accumulates like so unevenly? Oh, so, so um, when it's produced in the atmosphere, um, for, first of all, it's concentrated at the two poles, right? Uh, and this is very high in the atmosphere. And so the residence time for beryllium-10 is about a one to two years. And what happens, it migrates around and attached to some aerosols. Okay, and then it stays in the atmosphere. But when it rains, it comes down. Okay? So, it's kind of so this high basically it's reflected raining? the the rain pattern uh, ah, uh, okay. uh, over the world. And uh, so some places it has more than, and it can vary by as much as factor of ten. And another thing is that it, it changes over time, right? So this year, three years later, it's different. So that that's why it's so difficult mm -hmm. to do brilliant ten dating. Yeah, very interesting. Hi, um, not too familiar with the uh, atom traps, but can you do something with circularly polarized light in the trap to try to select for isotopes in that way? Uh, we, indeed, we do. We do use circularly polarized light. Yeah. So I, this gives me a chance to say a little bit about the atom trap. Where is the atom trap picture? Right here. OK? So, um, so we have uh, laser beams go, going in from six directions. Now, somehow the atom uh, scatter photons from, so there are two opposing laser beams. What we want the atom to do is if the atom wanders over, it wants to scatter more photons from this beam, less from that beam, so it gets pushed back, right? If the atom wanders this way, it needs to scatter more photons from this direction now. So how does the atom know? Uh, how, uh, is, how the atom is, why is it so smart? Well, so uh, the two laser beams have uh, different polarizations. They have the same frequency, but different polarizations. One circles this way, one circles that way, okay? And then we have two loops of uh, coils. Uh, we run the current in opposite directions. So now the magnetic field over here and over here are also in opposite directions. So we use the opposing magnetic field to tune the energy levels of the atom so that when the atom uh, steps out this way, it will be more in resonance with laser beam from this direction. That's, uh, this was all worked out uh, in Steve Chu's first paper on magneto-optical trap. Ah, yeah, so that's another Nobel-winning idea. Uh, actually, yeah, so this was uh, Bill Phillips' idea. You have laser beam going this way, you have atoms coming this way. Uh, how do you keep a uh, laser on resonance with the atoms as the atom slows down? Because the Doppler shift changes, right? So the young Bill Phillips had this brilliant idea. He said, well, I'm going to wind a uh, coil, solenoid, and I'm going to wind it unevenly so that the Zeeman shift here is different from Zeeman shift here. I will design so that uh, the, the, the changing Zeeman shift cancels the changing Doppler shift. I got a Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> he did a lot more work than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, in the ocean current one, I don't understand the application of dating because it seems like the whole current is all one age. Yeah, so... And it's all kind of now. So when we say the age of water, what we really mean is how long the water has been separated from air. Okay? So water in, at, at the surface, because they change krypton and argon, so they adopt this atmospheric value, which is a constant, okay? When the water uh, goes down, is separated by ground or goes deep into the oceans, then it doesn't have this exchange. Now the radioactive part of the krypton or argon uh, decays, low, so the isotope ratio get, get, becomes lower because of radioactive decay, okay? So by counting the argon-39 in the water sample, 
we will we'll, we'll figure out how long this body of water has been separated, has been separated from the, uh, the atmosphere. Okay? Now, if you just take one body and measure that, you can know the age, but you don't know how it flows, right? On the other hand, if you do a three-dimensional grid, map the ages all over the place, and get the age, then you can build and uh, figure out the flow pattern. Yeah. So you mentioned here, uh, you mentioned the high loading of the trap as a problem with respect to losses, so collisions of bit between the atoms and you lose them. Do you also have to worry about collisional broadening of your spectral lines, which uh, wash out, the, you know, bring in the tails of the more abundant species? Yeah, uh, so uh, the, that is not a problem. So usually people worry about collisional broadening in a, such a dilute sample when, they, when you're talking about, say, atomic clocks. Yeah, for example. Okay, so this is the line width of our trap. Okay? So if you want to build uh, very precise, you want to do very precise uh, laser spectroscopy on atoms, you want to build an atomic clock, that's unacceptably wide. Okay, they want a very, very narrow transition. But in our case, we just want to count the number of atoms. So this is just fine, even though there's a little bit of collisional broadening. Yeah. We have no problem telling the difference of this isotope from the next isotope. Yeah. Okay, maybe if there are no more questions, uh, it's, it's just uh, amazing how much atomic physics can do in all different types of fields, and it's because of uh, a lot of collaboration and uh, great insight due to uh, Lou and all his collaborators. Let's thank Lou once again for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much.